This is Lesson 6 of the New England Fly Tires Video Manual of Fly Time. I'm your host, Dean Clark. At the end of this lesson, you'll have accumulated, learned, and hopefully mastered a total of 35 fly tying skills. Skill number 35, the manual whip finish, is one of the most difficult to explain in words, sort of like describing a spiral staircase while keeping your hands in your pockets. But we believe that our method of showing and describing the manual whip finish will put you on the fast track towards mastering that technique. But we'll get into more about that later. The other three new skills you'll encounter in this lesson apply to making the body, tying in a hackle throat, and mounting the wings. Now all of that should be sounding very familiar to you because you've already done bodies, throats, and wings. However, both the materials and the configuration of this fly are different. And so are the techniques used in constructing the lead wing coachman. For example, Tying in the throat introduces yet another variation that starts out like the hackle collar of the Cadus pupa of Lesson 1, but ends up looking like the throats on the streamers of Lesson 3 and 4. Also, tying in the tails of the woolly worm and the warden's worry has a superficial resemblance to the wing technique used on this and most other wet flies, but with a couple of major differences. First, there are two wings, a left and a right, taken from a matched pair of duck primary flight feathers. These quill slips, as they are called, will be slightly curved. The correct orientation, one to another, is best described as praying hands, the convex sides facing each other. Not like this, which is the way quill wings are mounted on a dry fly, but rather like this. Not upright, but laid back over the body. Now, the point that should be made here is that skills mastered earlier have a direct application to new skills and make the new skills easier to learn. Keep this in mind as we look at the lead wing coachman. The lead wing coachman is a typical example of a great many wet flies. In years past, hundreds of wet fly patterns were developed. Most were identical in shape and construction, the variations being only in the materials used. Many of these early wet flies were pure flights of fancy, gaudy colors, exotic feathers, some no longer legally available. Many were simply mix and match concoctions derived from other patterns. The heyday of the wet fly has long since passed. Most anglers today prefer realistic nymph patterns over the classic wet fly design. But if the wet flies of yesteryear caught their share of trout, and they did, there's no reason why wet flies, plain or fancy, should not take trout today. And in fact, they still do. Our tire for this lesson is Dave Flint, who will now give us some further insight into the materials that make up the lead wing coachman. The classic wet fly has a throat, usually a soft webby feather from the neck or back of a hen or partridge. You have already learned two methods of tying a throat. In this lesson, you will learn yet a third method. A brown webby feather from a hen neck will be tied in and wrapped as a collar. The collar will then be split, pulled under the hook to form the throat, which when finished should fall just short of the point. Selecting a feather just the right length of fibers will require careful judgment. The gold tinsel tag you have done before, and the hurled body is not really difficult. The real challenges will be the throat, the manual wet finish, and particularly the quill wings. Wet flies are tied on standard wet fly hooks which are available in sizes from number two to number 20. We'll be using a size 10. Here are four new skills. Get your thread on the hook and wind back to the end of the shank. You've done a tag before, but this time we'll use a slightly different technique. Tie it in as before, but wrap the tinsel down around the bend.
Now reverse direction and wrap it back to the thread and tie it off. Select and cut three or four lengths of peacock hurl. If the butt ends are not aligned, cut them so that they are even. Lay the hurl on top of the hook with the butts one third of the hook shank back of the eye. Wrap the thread forward over the hurl to cover the butt ends and then wrap back to the rear tie-in point. There's something about peacock hurl that appeals to trout. Unfortunately, hurl is very fragile and is easily cut by the trout's teeth, in which case the hurl unravels. That is, unless you do something about it. You can reinforce the hurl by wrapping hurl and thread together to form a hurl rope. It will not prevent the hurl from being cut, but the thread will keep the hurl from unwrapping. Wind the reinforced hurl forward. Run out of reinforced hurl, twist some more around the thread. When you reach the butts, make one more turn forward. Unwrap the hurl from the thread and secure. Trim the excess hurl and half hitch. Select a brown hen hackle feather with fibers just a bit shorter than the hook shank and strip away the fluff. If you hold the butt end forward with the stem aligned with the hook shank, you can judge the fiber length as measured from the back of the eye to the point of the hook. Tie in the stem no more than one eye length back of the eye. Cut the excess stem and make the usual secure wraps and half hitch. Wind about four turns forward, almost to the eye, and secure in the usual manner. It may look like there will not be enough room for the wing and the head, but there will be when you complete the next step.
turn the collar into a throat, split the fibers at the top of the hook and pull the fibers down on both sides of the hook and underneath. Wrap back over the fibers just enough to hold them in position. Next, the wings will be fashioned from sections or slips cut from a matched pair of mallard duck quills. Pair meaning one left and one right. These slips must be matched in size and shape. The only sure way to do this is to select each slip from the same area of the same sweet spot on the same location of the wings from the same duck. Now, unfortunately, some packaged pairs of duck quills are not matched. Each feather may be from a different duck or from a different location on the wings. The worst case, of course, being when you have two lefts or two rights. Now, this happens. The best way to purchase duck quills is to buy a pair of wings. The leading edge flight feather of the right wing will match the leading edge flight feather of the left wing. This takes place right on down the line. For the wings, you will need a matched pair of slips cut from a matched pair of gray mallard flight feathers. They should be about as wide as the hook gave, but make sure they are exactly the same width as each other. This will be the far wing. And this will be the near wing. Dampen the finger of the left hand and place the far wing on the finger concave side down. Carefully align the tip of the near wing against it, letting just the tips touch lightly. When they are aligned, close the thumb down on the tips and transfer the butts to the right hand. Align the butts if necessary. This is the way they will be tied on the hook, but before you do, gently hump the wings by gently stroking them downward. This reshaping gives the wings a nice form that flows gracefully back along the fly. Measure the wings against the hooks so the tips extend beyond the bend of the hook. If the bottommost fiber is directly over the end of the hook bend, the longer fibers will extend about the right amount. Let the left hand take over and tie in the wings with several loose loop wraps. These should fall exactly at the rearmost wraps that bind down the throat. Secure the wings with a couple of tight wraps. Check the position of the wings. If they cock to one side or the other, use the butts to adjust their position. Continue to hold the wings in place as you cut off the butts. Don't try to cut them too close on the first pass. It could mess up your wings. You can finish snipping them closer after the bulk of the fibers have been removed. Cover the trimmed ends with thread as you form the head. The next and last new skill in this lesson is the manual whip finish. Now the reason that novice fly tires find the manual whip finish so difficult to learn is that it's very difficult to teach. Now we solved this teaching problem in our printed manual by breaking the seemingly complex movements down into a series of very simple to understand pictures. In this video version, we'll do the same thing. Using a television technique called the freeze frame, in each still picture, we'll provide you with a reference image that you can duplicate. And the movements between these freeze frames will be made slowly and very deliberately. If you make the simple movements between the freeze frames correctly, you should be able to do a whip finish on the first try. This step-by-step -step by the numbers method of learning can later be modified by telescoping and blending one movement into another. 
once you understand the principle, it won't be long before you'll be finishing your flies with that impossible to follow blur of flashing fingers that so confounds the beginners. Good luck. For the sake of clarity, we'll demonstrate with this oversized setup. Make a V for victory sign with the right hand and place the fingers across the middle of the thread with the thread lying in the crease of the first joints. This is freeze frame number one. Now, swing the bobbin up and over the fingers to place the bobbin tube close to and parallel to the hook. As you do this, the V for victory fingers maintain tension on the thread as they move below the hook. This is freeze frame number two. The thread forms a triangle with the base of the triangle between the fingers and the point or apex of the triangle at the hook. The tip of the bobbin is close to the apex. The next move is where many novice tires go wrong, so make sure the back of your hand always faces up. Imagine it behaving like a chair in a Ferris wheel as you swing the hand in an arc up and over within the limits of the loop until the fingers are directly above the hook. This is freeze frame number three. The triangle of the thread has now been inverted, base up, point down. The bobbin has not moved. The far leg of the triangle that runs from the bobbin to the middle finger will become the wrapped thread. The near leg of the triangle running from the index finger to the hook will become the wrapping thread. The next step is to position the far leg parallel to the hook. To do this, bend the middle finger down. This is freeze frame number four. Now you can see how the white thread is poised to wrap around the red thread. To start the wrapping, rotate the wrist clockwise away from you so that the index finger describes a circle around the hook. This carries the wrapping thread over the wrapped thread. The wrapped thread will move downward but must stay on the near side of the hook. Stop when the fingers are directly under the hook. This is freeze frame number five. Now this freeze frame looks something like freeze frame number two with the triangle below the hook and the apex pointing up, but there's a difference. The palm is no longer facing down. From this position, it is not possible to continue wrapping unless and until you turn the hand to the original palm down position. Simply rotate the wrist towards you. The triangle collapses and reforms again. Now, freeze frame six is exactly like freeze frame two, except that you have a half turn of wrapping thread around the wrap thread. So let's call this number two and move on to number three. As we do, watch the wrap thread go back to its original position. Here's frame three again, then on to four, now five, and back to six, which is the same as two. The important thing to remember here is that while the wrapped thread moved from the parallel position and back again, it never went around the hook. Wrapping the wrapped thread around the hook is a fatal mistake, and you won't know it until you try to tighten the thread. Now, a finger of the left hand takes over for the right, while the right hand picks up the bodkin, which takes over for the left finger as the bobbin is pulled back to tighten the loop. The only thing that can mess you up at this point is not having the loop around the hook as you pull the thread tight. Now, let's watch as Dave slowly does the whip finish to complete the lead wing coachman. If you exactly duplicated each freeze frame and the movements between them, then you did a successful whip finish. If you found that the whip finish was easier with the tool, then by all means, use the tool. 
However, if the manual was easier, then use your fingers. If you're not sure which you prefer, hey, practice both. You may just become proficient both ways. Now, what do you say you and I go on out on the river and we'll use this uh, fly that we just tied and we'll fish some pocket water? What do you say, girl? Pocket water is very different than the smooth flowing streams you've seen so far. Instead of a few currents that vary only in speed, pocket water is a patchwork of turning currents and eddies that split, curl, twist, and turn as the water threads its way through the many rocks and boulders. Look closely and you can see water moving in all directions, downstream, crossstream, round and round, even upstream, or standing almost still. A long crossstream cast will get you into immediate trouble. Pocket water means fast, close-in fishing. To keep in touch with your fly, a method called high sticking is used. The rod is held high to leave little or no line on the water. In shallow water, even the leader is held clear of the current as you steer the fly through the pockets. Don't overlook fishing downstream. In some ways, it's easier than casting across stream. Drop the line close and let the fly dead drift through a pocket or two before making longer casts. What gives this kind of water its name is the many underwater areas or pockets that provide fish a hiding place, as well as protection from the current. The broken water prevents the fish from seeing you clearly, so you can work close. There's little time for a fish to inspect your fly, so takes can be quick and unexpected. On your longer cast, you can swim the fly back by any retrieval method, including a slow lift of the rod, but allowing retrieved line to get carried downstream is never a good idea, especially in this type of water. Loop the line in the hand as you retrieve and feed the loops out one at a time as you cast. Rocky bottoms are treacherous to wade, even dangerous when the water is high. Felt soled or cleated waders and the wading staff should be standard equipment. If you're fishing near the bottom, occasional hang ups are to be expected. Try this. Strip off extra line and aim a sharp, tight roll cast beyond where the fly is caught. The line yanks the fly downstream and you're back in business. As long as the hook is not buried in a log or branch, it works most of the time. Stretches of pocket water are often interspersed with quieter pools of flat water. Any fish in such water will have a clear view of an angler standing upright at the head of the pool and fishing downstream. This is a situation where a cautious approach and a low profile are in order. Where fishing pressure is light, fish are easily spooked at the sight of anything that seems to pose a threat, such as a seagull, a heron, or a fisherman. Even a passing shadow will send fish dashing for cover. In heavily fished catch and release areas, fish seem less likely to flee. They apparently get used to seeing anglers and have learned just to sit tight and ignore not only the traffic, but your best offerings as well. It's the survival instinct at work. Too many fly fishermen overlook the importance of keeping themselves invisible. A bit of stealth will definitely enhance your chances of success.
Back casts are difficult to make while you're crouching. The line is prone to hitting the water, or the fly can bang a rock and you'll be fishing with a pointless hook. For catch and release fishing, barbless hooks are recommended, but fishing with a pointless hook is, well, pointless. Here's where the roll cast comes into play. The roll cast should be in every fly fisherman's arsenal of casting skills. If you haven't already mastered this useful cast, you should. No, I'm not quitting just because it started to rain. I'm only changing position. Here again, we stress the importance of a waiting staff. In situations like this, three legs are better than two. Oh, there's no danger of falling in and drowning here, but a spill could mean some nasty bruises, a broken arm, or even worse, a broken rod. Even in an easy to wade river that poses no danger, that third leg will come in handy for climbing up or down steep banks. You can buy a wading staff, a hiker staff can do double duty, or you can make your own. An old ski pole with a basket removed makes an excellent staff. So it's raining a little. So what? If a bit of rain doesn't bother the fish, why should it bother a fisherman? As a matter of fact, many claim that rain brings better fishing. The only rain you should not fish in is the kind that comes with thunder and lightning. Standing in water during a thunderstorm with an eight-foot lightning rod in your hands just plain doesn't make sense. The fascinating thing about fly fishing is that no matter how expert you become, some things will always remain a mystery. For example, a particular fish may take a fly only if it practically drifts into its mouth, or another fish may prefer to chase fast-moving prey, and, believe it or not, some fish will turn only right to capture a bit of food, while others will turn only left. When fishing blind, you never know how a fish is going to behave. Just as a pitcher varies his delivery, mixing high heaters, change-ups, and breaking balls, you should vary your delivery in the way you make your fly behave. Change position, probe different spots, and don't stick with the same retrieve. Faster trees, slow trees, dead drifts, or even hanging a fly in the current are some of the variations you can use as you try to find the winning combination. Here, the slow erratic movement of a swimming larva is simulated by a subtle lift and vibration of the rod, just enough to wiggle the line. A wet fly will behave like a nymph on the move. And here, a dead drift in the cross current makes the same fly behave like a drowned adult mayfly. As we pointed out in lesson two, what a fly moves like is often more important than what it looks like. Darn, another hang up. Looks like it's time to try the old roll cast trick again. Will it work? Yep, just like magic.